Now imagine if this side of the room was to believe that fire only illuminates. But this side of the room believed that fire, not only does it illuminate, it also generates heat. You know what you have now? You have one group that believes in one thing and you have another group that believes in another. Do you really think that you guys are going to get along? Eventually, group A is going to create an alpha and group B is going to create another alpha. And these two alpha males are going to create an environment that's vicious, hostile. They want to demolish the other group. Now, it is true that belief will give you purpose and meaning and direction and guidance. But it's also true that beliefs create aggression, fragmentation, division, bias, and ultimately violence. But here's the thing you need to know. The first moth, maybe he just doesn't have the capacity to be on the quest for a longer period. Maybe his capacity is just finished after five months. How capacities are given, I don't really know. It's kind of like Julian's question. Why are some people introverts? I don't know. Why are some people extroverts? I don't know. Why does history create Socrates, but only once in a while. I don't know. Why is LeBron James so good? I have no idea. The second moth has a, had a bigger capacity. It was able to be on this quest for more than five months, two years. And there is something else you need to know about the second moth's capacity. He had something that the first one didn't have. He had the courage to see the fire and yet be curious enough to say, what if I was to fly a bit closer to the fire? So remember, some of you will read a book, whether it's Bible, Dialogues of Plato, In Search of the Miraculous. You will only read it. And then because you've read a lot of books and they give you a degree and then they give you a job and then you begin to teach. And the only thing you will talk about are the information. The things you saw from a very, very far distance. So when you listen to Chris's question or dilemma is, why is it that someone reads fear and trembling? Or they just spit out information because they are the first moth. They sit, they read, and that's all they do. Some people get a little closer. So when you get an instructor, when you get a pastor, when you get a father or a mother who's seasoned, they give you information. But you also feel a little bit of passion. It makes you think and it makes you feel. And on the inside you move. You're inspired to change. Then you have a third moth who goes away comes back after 10 years. The king is very happy to see him and says, okay, well, what do you bring us back? 
The first moth is absolutely correct in saying that fire illuminates its surrounding. The second moth is also correct in saying that fire generates heat. But this is what I discovered. I flew very, very close to the fire. Can I show you something, my king? The moth asks. Of course. He takes this robe off the moth. And the wing on the right side is gone. It's burnt. And he looks at the king and says, if you get too close to the fire, it can burn your wing. And getting burnt is painful. You may never be able to fly again. It's dangerous. So if you want to publish any books on the front cover, can someone please put warning Look at fire, sit next to fire, but not too close. For those of you in this class who may one day get to a stage in your life where you really, really are curious and sincere about figuring out who you are, what you are, what your pathetic little place is in this grand scheme called life, you may find yourself gravitating towards this book called Daughter of Fire. It's about this 50-year-old woman who goes to India because she wants to be spiritual, whatever that may mean. And she thinks it's, you know, you know how people are casually about the Bible, the Quran, yoga, and all that stuff. She thinks it's really easy. You just go to India or you go to a yoga shop or you read the Bible or the Quran. You sit, you think, you write, and there you have it. You're a Christian, a Muslim, a yogi, a this, a that. But after 10 years of being with this man, on the very first page, you know what she writes. I'm going to stand outside of the gate of love with a gong, this huge drum. And I'm going to beat this drum really, really hard. And I'm going to scream. Those who want to come close and knock on love's door, hoping to enter, don't do it. Don't do it. It'll burn you. It'll destroy you. If that's a little difficult for you to grasp, let me give it to you this way. Long time ago, when you were 10 or 12 or 15, you watched a movie. And you watched this movie where this young boy kissed this young girl. And you said, oh, it's so nice. It's so cute. It's beautiful. He had some tiny little feelings about you. And you said to yourself, is this ever going to happen to me? Then you got to be 15 or 16, you were sitting in your class, and all of a sudden someone walks in, and you look at them, say, oh my God, they're so cute. And then you see them in the cafeteria, you guys spend some time with one another, and like the second moth, you say, man, I feel something, I really, really like her. And like the third moth, you begin to spend a lot of time with her. And one day you look at her and you say, I love you. Or maybe you don't. You just keep it to yourself. And then you realize you can't sleep. You can't eat. You're always anxious. You're always confused. You're always on edge. Your mom asks, honey, how are you doing? How the hell do you think I'm doing? 
Uh, honey, I just asked how you're doing. I made some dinner. I can't eat. Why the hell not? I'm in love. What has that to do with eating? I can't eat. And you realize how far you have evolved. As a kid, you only watched two people holding hands. Then you held hands with someone and you experienced the heat, the passion, the desire. And then one morning you wake up, you check your email, you check your cell phone and she writes, I can't be with you anymore. Sorry. Your wing has burned. Next time you want to go and fall in love with someone, be passionate with someone, now you have a warning inside you. Don't get too close. She's going to leave you. He's going to betray you. Don't do it. Now what you have are three groups in your community. The first group only believes that fire illuminates. The second group only believes that not only does fire illuminate, it generates heat. But now you have a third group. There is an added element that the first two groups don't have. Fire is good when it comes to bringing about light. Fire is good when it brings about heat. But it's awful when it burns you. So you know what this group, this new third group does? It warns the first group. Don't speak so highly of fire, man. It can burn you. And the first group says, no, no, it only generates heat. The third group says, no, it's dangerous. No, it only generates heat. Looks at the second group and says, listen, when you tell people that fire generates light and also heat, you may excite some of them and they may sit a little too close. And they may get burnt. My mother-in-law, one day she was doing boon. And if you don't know what boon is, Eritreans, it's a certain part of Africa, they have this tradition where they roast coffee, they grind it, they make it. They sit around and so one day as she is making this coffee, her scarf catches fire. And then her skin, her clothes catch on fire and her skin is burnt. And she's rushed to the hospital in San Francisco. And you know what happens when your skin gets burnt? They give you a lot of medicine, but it doesn't really do that much. And then every day someone needs to come into your room, put you in this wheelchair, take you into this tub, just scrape the dead skin off of you. And no amount of medicine is going to remove the pain from you. You just feel every goddamn thing. And when you sit and listen, there are like 20 people screaming at the same time because the dead skin needs to come off for the new skin to be created. So when you read in the Gospels, those who sit next to me, sit next to fire, you need to ask yourself a very important question. Are some people simply looking at fire? The answer is yes. Are some people looking at fire and also feeling the heat that lives inside Jesus Christ? And the answer is yes. Are some people getting burnt by him? And the answer is yes. And you have three categories of experiences. 
and they increase with intensity. And the need, what you need to understand is the following. As you go higher in your understanding, the less you're able to communicate with the friends in previous stages. If your friends only know that fire illuminates, that is your common language. You can continue to be friends with them. If on the other hand, you have an added advantage that you know fire generates heat, you try to convince your friends, but they will not understand because they haven't had the experience. They don't have the vocabulary. And out of 20 friends, you lose 15 of them. And God forbid, if you also know that fire burns, if you get too close. Because now your words have heat in them, have burned in them. Okay? And when you speak, the first category of people say, oh, you just saw fire. You're just being animated. آتش است این بانگ نایو نیست باد هر که این آتش ندارد نیست باد When you open your mouth and you ask a question or you say something someone like Socrates listens and says did he just see fire? did he see fire and feel fire? did he see fire, feel fire and got burnt by the fire? they smell the way you and I speak and they'll either run away from us or walk towards us because they see us as confidants, someone who understands. So now you have three divisions in society, and each try to convince the other that what they have is wrong. Are you beginning to smell Diogenes a little bit? Cynicism. that those who have more experience will never be embraced by those who don't have experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you explain how following a with like Kyrie Irving? No. Basically? And so like he posted anti-Semitic stuff, but he just like, they're telling him all this stuff to get back to the league. They're telling me it's like a $500,000 donation. I, I'm sorry. I have no idea who... He's a basketball player. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I was asking, like, how do you feel about that? Yeah. He made what comments? Anti-Semitic? He reposted a video that, like, I guess had ties to some anti-Semitic oh, okay. organization. But he didn't say anything anti-Semitic. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, Dave? Um, I just want to add on, because, um, yeah, uh, he posted a documentary yeah. that basically um, traced the Israelites back to Africa, and um, they called it an anti-Semitic film. And um, it has some really good like, uh, crazy. Just for him reposting it, he didn't have to learn this much more punishment. He got suspended. Fine and wanted an apology. He has to take classes and he has to leave the position. <laughs> so, how do you feel about okay. that? Because I feel like they do not hold white like, people to that same standard, you know? Okay, a couple of things. First, um, with your permission, I, I don't want to turn this into race. Um, I don't know much about white people, black people, brown people, yellow people, even though I may be a little bit of all. Um, let me approach it differently. 
I had a student many, 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 many years ago. Some of you may have heard of him. He used to live in Vallejo. His name is C.J. Anderson. C.J. Anderson, when he first came to my class, um, he was probably 18 or so. He played football for Laney. He oftentimes came to my class, and he was African-American. He oftentimes came to my class and my office very hungry. And so we would sit, and I would always go to La Farine, get a sourdough baguette, put some cream cheese in it. That would be my breakfast. Come to the office. He would come sit, and we would just have food together. <clears throat> he went to Cal, majored in philosophy. And apparently he was a really good football player. And he got picked by Broncos. And I think um, on a Super Bowl, he in fact did a touchdown. And so one day he came to class. And of course, you know, when he left Lenny, he said to me, Amir, when I make it really, really big, I'm going to buy you a car. He never did, of course, <laughs> which really upsets me. Um, and so uh, one day he came to class and he brought me some of his outfits. And it was a time where my niece and nephews were really into football. So I looked at CJ and I said, why don't you stand next to me? Let's take a picture. And the funny thing about CJ was that he was a show off. I mean, this is a man who's making like a lot of money. He comes to visit me and he sits right there. I say, CJ, man, just go over there, sit like other people. He says, no, no, I want to sit here. I said, hell, okay, fine. <clears throat> now, why did I take a picture with him? You know, CJ is a celebrity. How often do I get a chance to stand next to a celebrity. Am I friends with Brad Pitt? <laughs> Do I have Rihanna's phone number? No, I'm just a regular man who lives in complete poverty. I know no one of importance. And then I send that picture to my niece and nephew. And you know what happened? I got all these emails and calls from their friends. So tell us, how is CJ like? Is he tall? Is he short? Is he fat? Is he thin? I've had in the past many African Americans in my classes that became very angry when I spoke of Plato and Greece. Because they would say Plato stole all of his philosophy from Africa. I don't know if he did or not. But I can tell you why we do such things. When I connect myself, when I stand next to CJ, he embodies Broncos. He embodies perfection. He embodies celebrity. He embodies money. He embodies fame. And when I stand next to him, I inherit those things. Hillary Clinton. She's on a plane and she comes out and she says what? Oh, we got shot at. Not true. Never happened. But why do they say it? Would you like to meet Angela Davis? Yeah. Have you met her? No. Would you like to meet her? Yeah. And her friend Gina, companion? Yeah. And they have a dog. Yeah. Dog. Yeah, you can bring your uh, blind dog. Yeah. Why would you want to meet her? And let me also add, you know, in a couple of weeks, Oakland Museum across the street, they're going to have her life on display, Angela Davis's life. Would you like to meet her? Yeah. Why? An important person. Ah. What do you care? Because when you meet her, you get connected.
to a history that is rich. And it's a richness you enjoy. All of us in this class do such things. When you say you're a Christian, what are you doing? You take yourself as if you're sitting next to Jesus Christ. I understand Jesus. I understand the Bible. I am Christian. You connect yourself to a history that's rich. We do this all the time. The only difference is that we live in a very intense and highly politicized environment. You can't say anything negative about anything anymore. You guys should go online and check out this clip by George Carlin. I think it's called Soft Language. It is an amazing, amazing like 10 minutes. What has happened, he argues, and I think for the most part correctly, is that as time passes, we use language or we change language so that people are not bothered by it anymore. They used to call people crippled. Now they're just handicapped. They used to call people blind. Now they're visually impaired. <clears throat> so, you know, when you read, for example, the Gospel of Luke, there are many, many Bible scholars, New Testament scholars, who have argued that the Gospel of Luke really is an anti-Semitic book. Because it's a book that he rails against Jews. So, I'm not going to get into this guy's head as to why he did what he did or you know, why he created what he created. But what I can, what I can tell you is not a single one of us will reject an offer if it comes from Kim Kardashian or Brad Pitt or Jimmy Kimmel. That's how human beings are. You're vain, you're pathetic, and we'll do whatever we can to connect ourselves to a history that makes us a bit more valuable. It's human nature. Let me quickly just finish that third moth and then we'll move. We'll go home. The fourth moth, going back to the moth story, never comes back. And the king waits and waits and waits and waits. And then he looks at his people one day after 25 years and says, are you guys still waiting for the fourth moth? And they say, yes. It's never coming back. Why? He was so captivated by the fire that he just flew into it. And he got burnt fully by the fire. He became one with the fire. For I and the Father are one and the same. When you become a Socrates, Chris, when you become a Jesus Christ, if you've been consumed by the flames of honesty, truth, decency, what can you write about the experience? You just live the experience. You can't really talk about it. You can't write about it. Unless you're a Plato, where... You experienced so much and you felt so much and you have this intellect that says my intellect is going to be like Jesus Christ. It's going to come down, see the networks of my thoughts, see my emotions, break them open, see what's inside them, and then give them flesh and bones of language, i.e. words. 
then you have the dialogues of Plato. But you can't just read Plato because Plato is a kid who saw Socrates get crucified. This is a man who went inside the fire, saw what the fire looks from within. The thing that's missing on the front cover of Plato's dialogues is warning. This book may burn you. But academicians, people like me, don't see that warning sign on the cover. They just say, oh, this book is like reading a magazine. It's like reading the news on Yahoo. It's just set with information. I'm going to read The Republic, then go to class, spit out the information, and go home. And I'm going to give my students a quiz. You want a quiz? Make Plato into a living fire and sit back and see how many students are going to fight towards it. Those who simply look, give them a D. Those who look and feel the heat, give them a C. Those who get burnt, and the problem with getting burnt, man, your wife will not like you, your kids won't like you, you won't have rest, you won't have peace. You can't read any book that lacks the proper emotions. You can't have conversation with anyone that lacks the proper emotions. And God forbid if you go inside the dialogues and live inside the flames. Because when you're getting burnt by the fire, when you're in it, there is no one in there except you. You will have an immensely lonely life. Now, you may be married, you may have children, but your wife and your kids will never reach you. Now, you see, the guy who gets consumed by the fire has no fallacies. Fallacies are only seen by those who see, by those who see and feel the heat, by those who see, feel the heat and get burned. But the philosophy of Plato is complete. Only academicians see fallacies. You should go online and watch this man talk. Uh, Barth Ehrman he is perhaps the best New Testament scholar around. He'll tell you things that will just turn your head around 50 times. But the problem with him is that he has never sat next to fire. He'll give you great information, those information you will need, because they'll just, these are like fuel for the fire. But there is something missing in him. So if you want to feel and see what it means to have data but no heat, to have heat and data but not get burnt, to have data Heat, getting burnt, but not being consumed. Pay attention to the speakers, to those who write. Now, because of the element of lust inside us, you may want to go home and say, I want to be consumed by fire. But you may only be moth number one. Maybe you only have the capacity to look, but not touch. So don't allow inspiration to deceive you. Inspiration is good, but maybe it's best not to pursue it. It's good to see all of you. Have a nice day. We'll see you soon.